you're not holding your picture. No, that's a very old picture. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um, yeah, back when I had, you know. Hair? Well, I had hair. Time time time. Time. It wasn't gray then. <laughs> At least, you couldn't tell it was. <laughs> Will you pray with me, my friends? Loving God, source of all beginnings, may all we speak and hear be a reflection of your wisdom. May I speak in accordance with truth, hope, and grace in all your names. Amen. Uh-huh. Well, today we start the church season of Lent, which is the 40 days leading up to um, Easter. That, that doesn't count Sundays, just in case anybody's looking at their calendar. Does that include Sundays? Uh, traditionally, it's a time of reflection, of prayer, self-examination, a time of focusing on our spiritual journeys. And this year, um, during Lent, we're going to be looking at uh, mountains, the biblical mountains that figure so prominently in the Bible. Uh, and there are actually quite a few of them. Um, Ararat, of course, today, Mount Sinai, Mount of Olives, uh, Jesus' message on the Mount, the, Mount, uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and so on. And each one gives us a focus, a theme, for us to ponder as we reflect on our own personal spiritual lives. So we're going to begin today with Mount Ararat the mountain on which Noah's Ark is said to have come to rest after the flood, as we saw in that first song, which I, maybe you didn't sing it in CCD, but I sang it at camp, believe it or not. Girl Scout camp, we sang it. Um, <coughs> yeah. Anyway, um, the words were a little different, too. But anyway, uh, so there, there's um, the traditional site of Mount Ararat, which, you know, if you, if you look up Ararat um, on Wikipedia or in Google, it'll show you um, the mountain that's in the far eastern end of, of uh, Turkey. It's right on the border with Armenia, actually. And, but, and of course, there is debate about whether that is the actual, you know, the, the correct one, if that's the one that was meant or not. Um, but that's been the traditional one for centuries. Um, and some archaeological work has been done, and they found maybe some things, and maybe not, and maybe it's conclusive. And maybe, as with so much biblical archaeology, there's a lot we still don't know. Uh, but the specific location is, to me, less important than what Mount Ararat can mean for us. What happened there? The ark landed as the waters from the flood receded. And it was here that God made a rainbow promise to Noah that he would, that God would never again destroy the whole land. It was here that the ark was unloaded and the animals dispersed. They came off by threesies, threesies, as the song said. Uh, it was a new beginning. All other life had been destroyed, and mortals could begin again. It was a fresh start. A new beginning. We often, we aren't often given those chances, either as a species or as individuals. And I don't know, but I would guess that we all have times that in our past that we think about that we wish we could have a duel, a fresh start for something that, uh, or some time in our lives. Um, if we could only somehow go back in time. Now, there are a couple of theories about what might happen. There's sort of thought experiments um, about time travel and what might happen if we went back in time. One says that in order to escape the anomaly of preventing our own existence, right? You know, you can't kill your own you know, ancestor, grandparent, or whatever. Um, one says that uh, in order to escape the anom that anomaly, we couldn't change anything major if we went back, right? So that we couldn't make major changes, even if we tried. Uh, this is the premise of Stephen King's novel, 112263. I don't know if any of you have seen or read that. It's actually pretty good. I think it's one of his better ones. Um, but it's about a, a man who figures out how the main character discovers 
how to travel back in time, and he goes back and tries to prevent the assassination of JFK, thinking that that was a major turning point um, in history. <coughs> but in the end, he discovers he can't. He keeps going back and trying again and again and again, and that's not really a spoiler alert because there's a lot of other things that happen. So, um, but in the end, it, he, he can't change it. The other theory says that anything we might do in the past would have so many uh, ripple effects that uh, you know, no matter what we do, however minor it is, could change the future, or what we know as, as, as the future. Um, so, for example, accidentally crushing a butterfly, if you go back to the year 500, might result in Napoleon conquering Russia, or that flight was never invented, right? So that you, it's, that's called, actually it's called the butterfly effect. Um, and there, the French writer uh, Pierre Boulet, uh, who actually wrote two very, very different novels, uh, Bridge on the River Kwai, and uh, Planet of the Apes, he wrote both of those, believe it or not. And he also wrote a short story called Time Out of Mind, and it uses that uh, idea that no matter how small our actions, it can have a ripple effect that can change, change things. So, with both of those in mind, whether or not we do anything, it seems like you know, we're sort of stuck. So maybe going back in time to change what we did or said isn't the best idea, even if we could, right? Um, but both ideas seem to indicate that it shouldn't be done, even if it were possible. <coughs> now, although we can't go back, we are always going forward, right? The past is done, can't be changed. The future is still ahead of us. That's where we can make changes. Like Adam and Eve in Milton's poem, the world is always ahead of us open to possibility. Something um, I have discovered, and again, I'm willing to guess that many of you have had the same experience, that you know there are things that at one time in our lives we thought were absolutely impossible, that they would never happen, that they couldn't happen, that it was just so overwhelming to try to make them happen that they simply wouldn't happen. And yet, so one day we made that effort and we did, and we were able to do that, that thing, whatever it was. Um, whether it was um, a toxic relationship that needed to end, that's my personal one, um, a work opportunity that you desperately wanted, uh, maybe buying the home of your dreams, or maybe it was coming out. More is possible than we sometimes think, isn't it? Now, Jesus must have been feeling something like this in today's reading from Matthew. Um, he'd just been baptized by John, and in Jewish thought, a baptism is a cleansing for repentance and a new start, right? And Spirit sent him, the Aramaic word actually means drove, not led, it's drove, pushed, sent, those very um, active verbs, uh, out into the wilderness. And Jesus was looking for a start, a beginning, answers to what his ministry and life should look like. Uh, in response to God's call that he had just heard at his baptism. And there Jesus was tempted by all kinds of power. You know, the, that story uh, of, the, of the devil tempting him with, you know, different, different things, those are three different kinds of power. There's religious power, there's spiritual power, there's pers uh, I'm sorry, political power, spiritual power, and personal power. But he rejects every single one. And in so doing, he recognizes the form of his ministry, how he will do God's work. Jesus spoke truth. He gave guidance and healing and comfort in his ministry. He didn't look for power of any kind and in fact denied having any in front of Pilate, right? So this time of reflection, of refining the call, of making a fresh start, that's open to all of us. We don't need a physical wilderness. We can make that new beginning wherever we are. Whatever our circumstances, income, age, class, gender identity, sexual orientation, physical location, abilities, whatever it is, we have the opportunity to start again and become what? 
Is there something about your spiritual life that you want to change? Is there something missing? Is there a call to which you have not responded? A need that is unfilled? Questions you need answered. Now is the time to ponder this. That's what Lent is for. Make a plan to change those, that, that need, to fill that need or find those answers. We can't change the past, but we can make the future. So pray, read, meditate, talk with friends, listen for spirit talking to you. What is it you can do or need to do or are called to do? Now one morning, it may not be easy, which I think most of us are aware of, and it may be why we so often resist these changes. Simply knowing what you need doesn't change the fact that working for it, whatever it may be, uh, making any needed changes in your life or habits, doing something different, may create conflict either within yourself or with your friends or at work. Um, it may mean a change of work or where you live. When I came out as bisexual, I had friends who just simply could not accept this new thing about me, and I lost them. It happens. It's not the less painful for knowing that it might, but at least you, you know, you're, you're prepared and knowing that a lot of people go through it helps too. It's part of the process of a new beginning, of settling into who I am and who I am what I am called to do. And the same is true of these other changes in our lives. New beginnings, new life, new ways of being. This is what we can do this Lent. We can open our hearts and our spirits to what God is asking of us, is calling us to do and to be in the world. Reach out and grasp that new life a new beginning. In all God's names, amen. amen. <clears throat>